This is Andy Peterson, and you are listening to The Three Gun Show with Dave Hartman. Welcome to The Three Gun Show, episode 43. I am your host, Dave Hartman. And today, Craig Outson of Team Rainier Arms is back for round two. Before we get into the interview, I want to thank you for downloading and listening to the show. The Three Gun Show is a weekly podcast dedicated to the fastest growing shooting sport, Three Gun. Each week, I bring you an exciting new episode featuring an awesome Three Gun athlete, a manufacturer of multi gun specific products, and sometimes both. If you listen to episode 40, you know that the Three Gun Show was at the Three Gun Nation Pro Series Championship Shoot Off in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And while we were there, we did a live commentary, and I had a bunch of pro shooters who are also amazing guests on the uh, on the program to help me along with the commentary. Well, Pete at Three Gun Nation liked what we did. He reached out to see what we could do to collaborate. Uh, I provided the audio. Three Gun Nation did some fancy editing, and uh, they re-released an hour show with a mixture of both our audio. It's pretty cool. It was, it's done very well, and you can check it out at threegunshow.com slash 3GN15, right? 3GN15. If you like that type of format, make sure you let 3Gun Nation know by going over to their Facebook page. Uh, just type in 3Gun Nation into Facebook and uh, you know put a little comment on their post there telling them how much you like it. Now on to the show. This interview with Craig is a longer one, but you guys seem to like the longer ones as long as there's good content. And, the, uh, and this interview is full of great topics. We go light, we have some fun, and we also get a little serious talking about stage performance and uh, controlling your emotions. Then we get technical, and Craig breaks down the perfect gear selection, or at least what we decided was the perfect gear selection, for a uh, for a new to mid-level shooter that uh, is getting serious about 3-gun and needs to step up their gear. Links to everything we discuss can be found in the show notes, so just head on over to 3gunshow.com slash episode 43 when you get a minute. And now, please join me. Welcome back to the show, Craig Outson. Craig, welcome back to the Three Gun Show. Ah, it's great, man. I'm glad you have me back on. I've uh, been waiting. Well, this is great, dude. We, you know, we met at Three Gun Nation Nationals, but uh, you know, in October. Eh, it's about a month ago now that we're uh, that we're recording this, and uh, you are just the exact same person in <laughs> in person as you are on the podcast, tons of fun to talk to lots of jokes. So I'm excited to uh, do this again. No, oh, man, I try. It's, um, th- th- it's a pretty good life. I can't complain at all. We get to have fun. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys that, that take this seriously and I, I take the competition side seriously, but you know, it's uh, great people to hang around with. Um, I like the guys I travel with. I like the guys I get to shoot with. Uh, so overall, regardless of, of how everything else goes, it's pretty hard not to have a good time and smile and be able to giggle with each other after it's all over. Oh yeah, and I caught up with you uh, when we were waiting for awards, and uh, yeah, there was uh, there was many giggles to be had. It, it's hard not to have shenanigans with Garcia and Kalani around. Um, my, my whole goal in life is to make Kalani laugh because because usually he's kind of subdued and he's he's quiet and you know I mean he's 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 got his game face on and you know he's he's ready to just just cut your throat on the stage at any time, right? Because he he he's always calculating like that. He's always got. He's just ready to go. So if you can get him laughing, you know, that's the only way to get him off his game because the guy's just rock solid. So so it's all, it's always my goal just to just to twist him a little bit whenever I can. Well, and I did see him laughing when you did uh, the impression of Taron Butler doing an impression of Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, – Taron and I have gone back and forth for a few years with the whole Arnold Schwarzenegger thing, and um, it's, it's just kind of a running gag. Uh, we Actually, I just did a – Taryn handed me his phone just last weekend at Surefire and wanted me to, to film a stage. So I actually did it as a uh, kind of as a uh, Robin Leach and uh, we did li- <laughs> lives of the fast and furious on, on yes. a stage. So uh, that is yeah. awesome. As, as a matter of fact, when we were, when he, when he gets done with the stage and their unload show clear, Taryn finally like jerks his head back, goes, okay, shut it down. You idiot. You know? So uh, <laughs> obviously he could hear me while he was shooting. Um, <laughs> But no, great. He's he's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, Kalani's a lot of fun. Keith's a lot of fun to hang around with. Uh, there's so many there's so many kind of smart Alex in this game. Um, I think it kind of goes back to the to the type of personality that really objective serious competition draws. 
I think everybody has a real easy time making jokes and laughing at themselves because we're not, we're not really afraid of that direct competition. You know, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the game is so objective that if you have a, if you have an ego about your own faults or your own little idiosyncrasies, it, it just doesn't help you out to, to be that way with this game. It's, uh, the findings are too objective. The corrections are too objective. The timer is mean. The stages are mean. The targets don't lie. And so you got to have, you got to learn to have just a good positive interaction that way. And I think that plays off into us giggling with each other all the time. Yeah. And you know, it, the, the level of like shenanigans is not something that I was prepared for. Like at a, you know, a major match, I, I assumed I'd get there and, you know, everyone would be serious, but from like the, uh, what was it? Like the, uh, the, I guess the Thursday before um, the match started, there was just, you know, constant laughing and joking around by people walking the stage. It's like I, I was out there with uh, uh, Ravin and Rick and man, they were going back and forth and joking around with each other and stuff. Uh-huh. And I, I just expected like, you know, we talk about like the mental game of shooting a lot and how to get your head in the game and, you know, avoid distractions and things like that. And I guess I just really expected like more of like people being super focused on what was at hand, but there was a lot of, you know, joking around, having a good time and just, you know, general, I don't know if I want to say grab assery, but, <laughs> but maybe shenanigans is fun. Grab assery is a good word. I mean, I, you know, it's, I, I don't know exactly kind of where it starts or comes from. I, like I said, I think, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. There's, there's a little bit of an unwritten rule. 30 seconds before the beep goes off, you know, a minute before the beep goes off, somebody usually leaves a guy alone, right? You can tell that he's getting into that, that focus spot where he's trying to remember his stage and his stage programming. And, uh, you know, and then, and then if he trashes a stage, you, you might see guys kind of stay away from a guy for a couple of minutes, but it doesn't last very long before somebody goes over it and, you know, just, just drops your guts on the ground for you, you know, uh, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I got to tell this story. Um, Mike Voigt had a stage and his, we we're at mystery mountain and his shotgun puked on him. I mean, it was, it was horrible. It was middle of the stage. All he had left was shotgun targets. I mean, he ate like 85 seconds, something like that in penalties. I mean, it was oh, just, man. you know, had to leave targets. So there's FTEs and all that kind of stuff. And it, the, the next stage was our last stage of the day. And, and, and his fiance, Maggie Reese, they were there. They had their stuff in a cart and she had put some of his, her stuff on top of his stuff. And we get to the next stage and, and he's kind of like, Hey, you know, what the hell? You, you like, I don't have to shoot now. And she goes, she looks at him and goes, Hey, I saw your last stage. You aren't coming back from that. <laughs> Whoa. And, and so. That's constant, right? We're constantly kind of playing with each other. If we're w- doing walkthroughs, um, sometimes we're discussing discussing a a serious aspect of the stage, like what are you going to do? What are you going to do here? What do you think's faster? And and so often, a lot of these things are really um, oh, the execution is far more important than the actual plan. So a guy who executes 100% is probably still going to have a good score, whereas the guy who who spends all of his time making that perfect plan may not. And so sometimes it becomes a little bit of a joke where you're trying to get somebody else, hey, you know, you should do this. You, you should take that 50-yard shot with your pistol on this 4 by 10 piece of steel and then hot reholster, you know. And, and, and so there kind of becomes this joking, and then it plays over into how you shot. And it plays over into to everything. Um, and even to the point of, you know, it, it, everybody's going to, you're going to have a bad stage. You're going to make, you know, make a mistake or, or kind of tear one up. And overall, what you notice is, is that most guys aren't real tolerant of somebody having a, a hissy fit. Um, you know, we, we just, we tend to just not really allow somebody to have a tantrum. And within the group of guys that I shoot with, we kind of have a rule that you'll give a guy five minutes to kind of, you know, go over, beat himself up, you know, go through what he did wrong. But, after five minutes, it's back to game on. Then we can make fun of the incident. And if the incident's serious enough to where you can get a good joke in in that five minutes, um, it's excused if after you, you know, hurt the person and cause them an eating disorder, that you just hold your hands up and go, <laughs> too soon? <laughs> so if, if you can play those two things off, you know, it, it really it really lightens the mood. Because like you said, we are pretty serious about the competitive side of it. And I don't think anybody would survive 12 hours of the day trying to be that focused. 
you have to learn how to focus that down when it's time for you to run the stage, when it's time for you to work the stage. But the rest of the time, you really do have to kind of maybe, maybe we back it off a little too much, but you have to back that off um, just so you're not exhausted at the end of the day, you know? You know, that's a, that's a good point. And probably something a lot of people can take away from is maybe not to, uh, to take it as too serious, but there was a couple things that I really liked that you said there. You know, one is that, 30 seconds before the buzzer goes off, you, uh, you know, you allow the guy to, um, you know, get their head right and get in the moment and stuff like that and get, get prepared to shoot. Whereas I've seen, you know, people hollering at each, at each other, like during a shoot, which, you know, not really my style. But the second thing you said was like, you know, when someone has a bad stage, you don't allow them to have a hissy fit. And I really like that too. You know, there's, there's been times where, you know, guys will throw like a tantrum and they just kind of like you see, like it, they're looking around for someone to, you know, air that out to or or open up to or look for look for like a, you know, a sympathetic ear or something like that. And I, I've done the thing where, <laughs> you know, I learned this from training my dog is when uh, when there's behavior that you don't want to reinforce, you just kind of turn your back. <laughs> and that's that's what I do oh, yeah. when, uh, when yeah. those tantrums happen. Well, here, here's just one guy's take on it, and, and this by no means means that every tantrum that you see is exactly this, but it's totally it's totally understandable for a guy to have some malfunctions or, you know, run by a target or something that they normally wouldn't do and be upset at the end of that stage. And and to take a couple minutes and be like, you know, either 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 mad at themselves for making the mistake or maybe angry at their gear for a minute or whatever. But personally, I think... When guys have this extended 10-minute hissy fit, throwing gear, breaking things, kicking kicking inanimate objects, you know, um, and, con- and and continuing to just like, you know, to everybody that will come around and tell them exactly what went wrong and how, it, you know, all of this stuff. What it says to me is, is that what you're really trying to convince everybody of is that you're better than what you were. You... Um, you kind of, if, if you're if you're really really angry, then that must have that mistake must have been really out of character for you. And, uh, that's a good point, right? And and so the more the more anger and the more show you can put on, then that must mean that that your true shooting self must be a whole lot better. And I think with time in the game, you start to realize that you know I mean, kid, you, you see kids do it and and, and stuff like that, but. Time in the game kind of teaches you that, hey, you can still make those mistakes. Even even guys that shoot at a really high level um, can, can make a mistake now and again, you know, and, and run by a target or forget to program something in. Or or even a gun malfunction happens at just the right moment in a stage and they completely, you know, they completely forget the rest of the stage plan. And it happens all the time. And I think what that teaches you is, is it's it's not something that's worth throwing this big dramatic thing over. It's worth going back, you know, figuring out what went wrong, fixing up whatever. And then you've still got stages to shoot. You've still got the rest of the match to shoot. It's really not worth having these temper tantrums because all they'll do is, is, you know, eventually cost you even more mistakes and more penalties. Yeah. So, so maybe as far as like the, uh, the mental game goes, we don't need to all be like Zen like Buddhas, but uh, just controlling your emotions somewhat to be like a rational person might be a good way to put that. Absolutely. Right. I mean, I, it's unreasonable to think that you wouldn't be upset over a poor performance. Uh, you know, you've done a lot of practice, you've prepared, you spent money to get to this match, all of those kinds of things. Um, but you have to realize one, uh, you know, you're only in control of what you do. So if you let those emotions, you know, you can't control how another shooter performs. You can't control, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things. The only thing, the only person you're in control of is you and your performance. So if you have a bad performance and you allow that to emotionally upset you to the point that it negatively affects your next performance and your next performance, and obviously, you know, you've missed a major factor of this game, which is that emotional control. So go, go over, you know, be mad. Uh, it, it's, it's unreasonable to not be upset. You practiced for something and you didn't, you didn't meet your expectation. That's upsetting. It's totally reasonable. But you have to be able to compartmentalize that so that that next performance that's coming up in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever the stage difference is, uh, you can then, again, be back in emotional control and can perform. So when you have like a, 
a moment like that where, you know, something went wrong and you've got to overcome and you've got to, you know, reset for the next stage. Are what what are like the specific mechanics that you personally do to get that out of your head to move on to uh to reset your frame of mind? I think the biggest mechanic that I, I try to utilize if, if I've had a bad stage uh where 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 the whole stage to borrow Travis Gibbs term where the whole stage just goes gunny sack, right? Um you had some malfunctions or you forgot targets or anything like this. Um if I've had a really bad stage, I think one of the best things for me to do is one Go, you know, go get my gear off, get my gear sorted, follow your same routine that you would do, uh, to prepare for the next stage, you know, load, uh, load your empty mags, you know, prepare your gear for that, for that next stage, whatever you would do, but get right back to resetting. And then as soon as you get to that next stage, get right back to, you know, breaking the stage down and thinking about that next stage plan. What you want to do is stay on track and really avoid harping on that bad performance um now let you know assuming that it, it, the bad performance didn't involve a gun malfunction where you need to to fix a gun or repair a piece of equipment um what you really don't want to do is is focus on that mistake and focus on what went bad because what it'll end up doing is that's all ta- that's all time and preparation and mental effort that you now are not putting towards your next performance so so you're you're basically trying to put that in the past, like put that in the past bucket that happened. That's not me. I, you know, yeah. I'm not defined by that. Be present as far as like taking care of your gear for the next stage and then look forward toward the next stage. Absolutely. Great way to put that. And, and it's maybe not even, uh, maybe putting it in the past might not be the best terminology. What I want to do is compartmentalize it. Now, later on in the evening or, or okay. later on after the match, when I go over what went wrong in the match, I can bring that box out and review what went wrong. So I can, if there's something I can fix, I can make those changes or anything like that. Uh, but what I don't want it to do is be out. I, I don't want it to be open luggage on the range. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, that totally does. Just pack it away for analysis later yep. rather than, uh, sitting there and stewing on it for the rest of the day and letting it affect your, your next stage. You know, if, if you step to the line at the next stage and, and your thought, if, if your thought process is like, okay, I've got this stage plan, I'm going to execute, I'm going to do this, this, and this for this stage. That's where you want to be. If you step into the box on the next stage thinking, okay, I've got to make up for that last stage. I can almost tell you how that stage is going to go for you. Yeah, or boy, it sure would be embarrassing if I screwed this one up as bad as I did that last one. I hope I, I hope I don't do X again on this stage, right? <laughs> I don't need more shit from Craig. <laughs> well, and and I mean, here's the thing: we've all done it. I think anybody who's shot this game for a while and is honest with you, they they can probably tell you a stage or a match where they did just that and it, they couldn't get away from it, you know, or or uh, it caused an even worse wreck on the next stage. And so it, it, it kind of just, it's, it's essential that you're able to compartmentalize that and get focused on, on the next task at hand, which is the next stage. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of looking at it. So that's, you know, that's what I really try to do. It's hard. Um, it's, it's hard not to talk about it. It's hard not to, you know, emotionally, you want some support from your buddies. You want that commiseration from, you know, somebody else saying, Oh man, I feel bad for you or whatever. And, and it's, you know, I'm not saying you can't do that at all, but, uh, at the end of the day, there's another stage coming up and you've got to prepare for it. And, and the only way you can prepare for that is kind of set that mistake aside and, uh, allow yourself to, to move on and, and get ready for that next stage. Yeah. And that's an interesting point that you said, you know, commiserate, like, uh, you almost want one of your buddies to, like pat you on the back and say, you're better than that. Oh, don't let it bother you. Oh, or oh yeah, like you, you want somebody to come and kiss your forehead and put a victim blanket around you, and, and <laughs> you know, you know, tell you how many po- how many seconds they take off your score because we really do know you're better than that. And that was such an anomaly for you to make a mistake that r- really we can't count it. You know, I mean that that's like a lightning strike. What happened to you out there, right? You you want to hear that? Um, yeah. But well, you know, it's it's funny the the, uh, the like the juxtaposition of you know we're you know, these, these manly men and most of us have beards, not most, but you know, all the manly ones do. And we, we have like all these black rifles and these scary long shotguns and pistols that hold a ton of rounds. 
And really, we're just like super fragile egos oh. waiting to be damaged. Well, and, and, and like I said, I'm, I guess that's I, I know not everybody maybe sees this or thinks this of, of this sport. But, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. This sport is incredibly objective. Um, the timer can't lie. The targets can't lie. The bullets don't lie. Um, you know, all of those things are, are, are very much tell the truth. And so if, if you're going to if you're going to allow yourself to get emotionally hurt by, you know, what the vision of you versus the actuality of you performing, it's going to be a tough sport to stick around in. And so back to the giggling and laughing and guys pretty, you know, by and large, you've got some of the most most good natured people in this sport. And I think it's because they, after a while in the sport, you kind of learn to let that stuff slide, that, that your perception of yourself with respect to your ego, um, you know, has to be dialed back a little bit. Otherwise it's going to, it's going to eat you up. Oh, for sure. So, well, and, and you know, one of the things that I think you do well is that you help out, um, your fellow shooters. I've, I've seen you do it and I've also heard stories about you doing it. Um, a local shooter uh, here, uh, Terrence Jackson, yeah. was uh, was my uh, my ride buddy on the way out from Colorado to uh, to Tulsa, and so and I, I believe you got didn't you guys shoot on the same squad? Uh, no, we didn't. I think they were one squad off of us at uh, at three gun at nationals. Okay, well, anyway, so he he's apparently shot with you before, and he's mentioned yeah. about how much you've helped his uh, his game. That's awesome. And, I'm glad. Yeah. In that, yeah, it's totally cool. It's like, hey, I know that guy. But <laughs> um, in the last show, one of the cool things that happened, and for those uh, for those you know new listeners out there, they're just joining us. Craig was on episode eighteen, and uh, you can check that out at threegunshow.com slash episode eighteen. Uh, Craig and I talked a lot about um, you know shotgun setup and like the mystique of the perfect shotgun. I told him a story about my shooting buddy Bill, who uh, <laughs> was having some problems with his FNH SLP, and uh, he was gonna. Uh, get a Browning A5 to uh, mitigate that problem. Well, Craig, one of the coolest things that's happened from this show is like actually reaching people, changing their game, changing their setup and stuff like that, and actually improving their three gun experience. The advice that you gave on that, which was to tune a couple parts, change some springs, Bill followed to a T and he's not had a problem with his SLP since like you fixed his problem, like over the, the ether <laughs> through the podcast. That's an awesome story, dude. That's perfect. That's, that's good. No, I, you know, it's like we said on the show, I really like the SLP. I think it's a good gun and there's every shotgun has its little idiosyncrasies and, and it, sometimes it takes a little work to figure them out. But when you do and, and you keep, you know, a couple parts on hand or, you know, which, you know, it, it's like, maybe it's like being sick or, you know, doctors diagnose an illness by kind of what you're showing and what you're not showing. And sometimes you just need to learn that from your shotgun when it does you, when you have a feed malfunction, it might be this in this gun or, or vice versa. So that makes me happy that he's able to get his gun running because I, I really do. The SLPs are a good gun and I hate to see, I hate to see anybody with any particular gun, um, get into the, you know, the endless change of, of setups simply because like we talked, I don't think there's a perfect one out there. Everyone's going to give you a, a little bit of this or a little bit of that. And, and, uh, sometimes you just have to learn that. And ultimately your game's better because you're not changing platforms all the time. You know, I've seen a lot of good things out of the, the SLPs as well, and I'm kind of bummed that you were able to fix Bill's problem because I was <laughs> going to totally buy his crappy junk shotgun when he got that A5. So You had him, I mean, had him talk down to 400 bucks for it, huh? <laughs> well, it, was, it wasn't working right, so couldn't pay full price. Yeah, I'll give you 350 bucks for that piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, let's let's wait. I'll give you scrap value for oh, it. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, so... Yeah, so that's one of the cooler things about about doing the podcast and hearing like the feedback. So I I knew that I had to tell you that story, and I didn't think I did it at nationals. So no, that's awesome. I'm glad. I'm happy for him. I'm really happy for him. You know, on the on the on the side of helping people out too, I've I, it, it's it's amazingly flattering for me, and and it's actually really humbling when I when people have told me, "Hey, thanks so much, you helped me out," or or you know, it was really nice shooting with you. You're really accepting, and um, to be honest, it's not. Uh, it's not something that I that I that I go to a match intending to do. I just know that there was so many people when I was shooting who didn't hesitate at all to help me. So I guess what my intention is always to be is is I you know barring that it's it's some kind of you know that I'm stepping in the box and the buzzer's going to go beep. 
I don't ever want to be that guy that tells somebody no or blows them off or, or doesn't share the information that I have. Um, because it was, I learned everything that I've learned from somebody else. Um, Kurt Miller, Pat Kelly, Mike Voigt, Jerry, you know, all of these guys that some people look at and say, Oh, you know, maybe they get a little starstruck with them. And I, I had no idea who they might have been when I first started shooting. You know, a couple times I got squatted with somebody and I would ask a question and they would answer it, you know, or if they saw something that was glaringly obvious that I was doing that was, that was stupid, you know, they helped me out and they were always really nice about telling me that, Hey, that might not be the best way to go. And so, like I said, I just really, I, I really don't ever want to be that guy that doesn't, uh, that a new shooter feels like they can't talk to or the new shooter feels like they, they can't, um, they can't relate to, or that a new shooter would feel like that they're going to ask a silly question. Uh, Cause the fact of the matter is, is it's, it's really hard to get the knowledge in this sport without talking to people. And, and there was just, there's so many people out there that have, have you know, if I were to make a list of, of guys that helped me or talked to me or, or offered, you know, just a little knowledge or, or just were good squad mates, you know, just they shot a match and they just encouraged you. You had a bad stage and they still told you, Hey, you know, that, that was pretty solid, you know, keep your head up or whatever. Um, just good people like that make all the difference in the world. Why do you want to shoot this sport? So. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I've experienced that myself and, you know, for me, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a shy, shy person, so I won't reach out and be like, Hey, you random guy, you know, what's your stage breakdown here? Here's what I was thinking and stuff like that. Cause you know, and it's probably a lot for ego. Like you don't want to feel like, you know, your stage plan sucks and everything, Right. but that's the only way you find out that your stage plan sucks and then <laughs> you can get a better one. And one of the things, the, the early parts of my, you know, three gun shooting career, I took a, a class from, uh, um, Mark and James at carbon arm. Yeah. And then, uh, and then a few months later took an additional class from, uh, just James and just in like the the pre and post BS sessions about you know technique way to, ways to think about the game gear setup and stuff like that not even like the actual like shooting and stuff just the talk was so valuable that you know that's one of the reasons I started the podcast is just reaching out getting that information out there and this is kind of cool because it gets to reach you know thousands of people a week rather than just one individual. Well, you know what? It was, it was funny. We, um, so we, we've talked, we're doing some three gun classes down at the tactical performance center in, in, uh, in St. George. And we, we did our first kind of trial class. Um, and, and we had a great class. We had a good time. We learned so much as instructors as to how we're going to structure the course differently and whatnot. But that was one of the things that came back was that, uh, the just order and lunch in and, and eating sandwiches while the instructor, you know, while we just kind of, Hey, BS a little bit was just as valuable as some of the court, some of the classwork that we had, you know, had set up an idea, idea of what we wanted to teach. And so, like you said, the, the value of just BSing and talking to people in this sport is huge. Um, and especially somebody like James or, or Mark, you know, I, I think at times some people will kind of discount Mark Passamanic a little bit uh, because, you know, he, he's not that big name shooter. But they don't realize that Mark passamatic has been in action shooting sport, I think, since like the late 80s, early 90s. So Yeah, like he was number three shooter or something like that, or one of the first three in like the uh, the first IDPA club here in Colorado. Yeah, and he shot all kinds of different sports. He's got a lot, you know, a lot of experience in rimfire steel and steel challenge and IDPA. And so he's, you know, he's he's got this experience. And w- when I first met Mark, he was generally ROing matches. And as a sharp RO, ROing, you get to watch everybody shoot a stage. You get to see all kinds of stuff. And, um, you know, some of those guys actually, you know, they, they might, they might have a lot more knowledge than maybe their shooting performance might suggest. And it's, it's, it's another one of those things. Don't discount who's talking and who you're getting to visit with because everybody's got a little bit of something to offer, um, with respect to how the sport works and how it runs and, We've talked. I'm a story. I, I like stories. I like listening to stories. I like telling stories. Um, and I learned so much from it is, is really one of the reasons why I like it. And so, you know, I, that, if I had a message to newer shooters out there was even if you're intimidated to talk to guys, 
stand around. If, if you can, if you can offer something, great. If not, it's, it's worth just listening to the conversation. Um, there's a lot to be gained that way. And, and through that, you're going to make friendships and, and all of that. And you're, and you're going to find out most of the guys who the, who you think, Oh, I could never talk to that guy because he's so good. That guy puts his pants on one leg at a time in the morning, just like you do, you know, and he's, he's, he's probably even more sympathetic to you as a new shooter. Cause he knows that he's been there to get to your point. And so, uh, that's, you know, I think the, the grassroots nature of the sport is something to never dismiss and realize that it, it's, it's really important, uh, to make it successful. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think like the, uh, the people that have been doing it for a number of years, like yourself and, you know, like the, uh, uh, you know, the Kurt Millers and the Jerry Mitchell X and stuff like that have done a really good job of passing that tribal knowledge down as far as like being open and, and not just being, you know, closed off and like, Hey, these are my secrets. Scram son. I'm not going to talk to you about this. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a sport where you can, and the good thing is most people are like super opinionated. So once you get them talking, you know, it's, uh, you're going to find out a lot of good stuff. Yeah. There's generally not any gray area there. Um, good, whether it's good or bad, you know, the internet has helped this sport so much. Um, I, I don't really consider myself necessarily like an old guy in this sport, but I'm certainly, you know, I, I've been shooting it a long time. Um, when I start, we were talking about this the other day and, and when I started, you know, not to give you the uphill both way, uphill and snow both ways to school, but there was one place to get shotgun shell side saddles for your shotgun to load from one place. And it wasn't on the wow. internet. You had to call the guy and you kind of had to order it. And sometimes, you know, he, he either made them or he didn't. And you know, that, that's about how it went. Um, you know, there was some, there was like some cheap plastic ones that you could get from Tapco or whatever. At a, at a gun store, but that was, that was the game, right? You made a bandolier type thing that went across your chest, the held shells and a Velcro side saddle. And, you know, now the problem is, is how do we decide what shell holders to get? You know, we got Invictus, Tapcom, AP Custom, Carbon Arms. We've got all of these, you know, good products that we get to choose from. And the internet is awash with information, which it's good and bad. On one hand, you get to learn a lot. Um, on the other, maybe not everything you're hearing is, is exactly correct, but what's, what's never bad is hearing that firsthand experience history from the guys who have shot. Um, you know, to, to listen to, to Pat Kelly, Gary Pull, and Mike Voigt, all those guys talk about, uh, Jim Clark, Benny Cooley, to listen to those guys talk about the first soldier of fortune matches. That is always valuable to me. Um, you know, we can argue what, whose shell carriers are the best. But, um, you know, we got to spend a week with Bruce Pyatt building 1911s out here just recently. And, and just the, just how much work those guys did to shoot when, when, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, building their own guns. Um, you know, the reason they got good at doing trigger jobs was the parts at the time weren't very good. So you had to be able to do a trigger job mid, mid match, uh, because your fire control parts went gunny sack on you. Yeah. And yeah. And we're very fortunate that as, you know, modern shooters, we don't have to carry a ton of spares. I, Whereas, you know, when you're running on the ragged edge of parts you made yourself, you got to carry some spares just in case you weren't as good as you thought you were. Exactly. Like, you know, I, I've heard the stories of the, you know, the guys when, when open first started, they were carrying three red dots. And so it's just, it's totally interesting. I love going to matches. I love talking stories with those guys. I love learning. And that's, I guess, you know, to, to bring this full circle is that's, I just always encourage new guys to not be, to not be shy about, you know, coming and, and going to dinner. Ter Terrence is a perfect example. Um, you know, he had shot with us and we, we knew he was alone. So we we're like, come to dinner. And he's like, are you sure? We're like, you got anything else to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got a better date, you know? Um, <laughs> well, you were in Vegas. Yeah, we were in Vegas. Well, you know, I mean, that's cool. If you got a better thing to do, we'll tag along with you. But, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was just kind of like that. And, and, you know, it's, it's just, I think that, that inclusiveness in this sport, it, so many people are really good that way. And, uh, I, I guess, like I said, it, it's humbling to hear people appreciate it. And, and, and I'm glad that, that doing it helps people out. Yeah. And now Bill has a working shotgun. So. <laughs> and you had to pay full price for one. Ah, damn it. <laughs> well, Craig, speaking hey, of shotguns. Hey, Bill, Bill, 
SX2 suck. You should sell that thing to Dave for cheap. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. What, that's what I'm saying. What you need, Bill, is a used Versamax, and I have one for sale right now. No, that's that's how we'll go there. Bill upgrades, I upgrade, everybody wins. Exactly. There you go. Well, so, okay, so speaking of shotguns, mm-hmm. you had, like, a, another amazing experience. You went to the uh, the world, um, the Ipsic World Shotgun Shoot in Italy, and how's that for an awesome transition right there, shotgun to shotgun? That, that was one of the most beautiful segues I have ever heard, honestly. I, I'm, I'm writing this time down. This is, like, a, a good moment for the show, but so, so Greg... <laughs> Uh, I know that you're like just you know bottled up with excitement of you've got so many good good stories to tell, and uh, and I made you not tell me them, <laughs> and I can't wait to hear them. So <laughs> so all right, it, it start it starts with a fun trip to the airport, right? Okay, well actually it starts before that. Let's let's oh no, let's, let's go back to 2012 to the first uh, Ipsic World Shotgun Shoot. Um, Kurt Miller. Uh, Ty Gentry, some other guys had talked about going. Um, I knew that they had been international to shoot some some other ma- other shotgun matches as well as some rifle matches. They talked about how cool it was, how neat everybody was. So I'm like, I'm in. And we go to the 2012 match, and we get there, and uh, we were supposed to have ammo sent, and it didn't make it, and blah, blah, blah. We try to use shoot some of the ammo that's there. It's Eastern European. It's not very good quality. It doesn't run in the open guns very well. Um, the crimps are all sorts of different shapes, all that kind of thing. So we have, we, we fight through some malfunctions. We still shoot pretty well, but the open team has a pretty rough go at it. Uh, Jerry actually finished ninth, zeroing a stage. And so, you know, it, wow. it could be argued that, and, and, you know, that was the stage that zeroed him. He had, you know, we still, we both still had multiple malfunctions elsewhere. So if, if we had guns running, you know, who's to say that the, the, the results could have been much different. But, so we had this, we had this awesome time. The experience with the people is awesome. All those kinds of things. So since it happens every three years, I mean, literally on the way home from this match, I'm like, I'm going to the next one, whatever it takes, I'm going. Um, they'd already picked the place. It was going to be in Italy. Uh, actually a town called Anya and um, I'm in, I'm totally in. So about a year and a half ago, not wanting to have the same experience with the ammo again, um, I, I made a couple phone calls and Shane Naylor, who was at Remington arms at the, you know, was at, with Remington at the time. Um, we, I, I shoot a lot of Remington shells. They run great. In my shotgun, you know, we've talked about ammo quality and consistency. Uh, the, the Remington STSs are awesome in my gun. They're 100%. I don't have any ammo-related malfunctions. I love them. So I call Shane and I said, hey, you know, I, I realize I'm not necessarily Remington team or anything like that, but here's the deal. My gun loves your stuff. I shoot your stuff all the time. I'm going to the world shoot. Is there is there any chance, you know, it's a long shot. Is there any chance that you can get ammo there for me? And he's like, Absolutely. You know, we'll take care of it. Uh, we got another shooter who's going, and um, he's like, I'd appreciate this not turning into everybody, you know, 50 people calling me for ammo getting shipped to Italy, but we can take care of the two of you. We'll get you ammo. And um, he he turned it over to Dana Claybrook at Remington, who was, who was fantastic to work with. She actually knew the range that we were going to. She's like, this will be no sweat. We'll have it there. And they shipped it. And, and our ammo is going to be there. And I'm, ex- you know, now we're a month away, month and a half away from the match. Um, many, many emails. Okay, you know, are you sure the ammo is going to get there? And, and you know, Dana like would reply, and she's she's super sweet because you can tell that she's, you know, about ready to tell me like, hey, quit hounding me, idiot. I, you know, I know my job. I'll get it there. Go pound sand. Sir. <laughs> Leave me alone, you know. And uh, <laughs> but but she got it there, and the range actually refused the shipment. Why? Um, so th- there's many possibilities. One possibility was that was floated was Italy had, had changed their ammo restrictions and laws, and you could only buy ammo in Italy with a license, an Italian gun license, so they didn't know who the ammo was for, so they sent it away. The, the other story was that uh, Fiocchi was the match sponsor, so they didn't accept ammo shipments from any other ammo company. Um 
I, the third explanation is, is that it could have been a, you know, nefarious deal to, to make sure the U.S. team didn't shoot very good. That's the least likely. Um, but I, I think a combination of the first two was, was to blame. There was, you know, Fioki's trying to sponsor a whole match. Um, and, and so, you know, and not that it was someone at Fioki that made this specific decision, but there was probably an instruction that, you know, we're the match sponsor. This is the match ammo. There's going to be no other ammo at the match. So, oh man. Um, so w- was everyone shooting Yoki ammo then? So, well, yeah, most everybody had to shoot the, the match ammo. And for, for some folks, it worked pretty well. Um, some folks still experienced some, some malfunctions. Um, those people that shot. So, so with the ammo restrictions and what you fly across, uh, you know, what you can fly with. Almost everybody takes their own slugs and their own buckshot because that's the that's the hardest to pattern, that's the hardest to figure out where it shoots and all of that kind of stuff, right? So you can you right. can take enough buckshot and slugs of your own, but those people who didn't, the Fioki buckshot had a, a crimp that only had four pedals on it. So when you look at a shotgun shell, most times a crimp is six or eight. On really good shells, Remingtons and double A's, uh, the STS and the double A's, you'll see eight. Well, this Fiocchi only had four, and so it would the, the the crimp end of the shell would turn square. Whoa! So there was all kinds of feet, some feet issues with it. Um, my gun, in, yeah, it, it it was high base ammo. Um, most of the Europeans like to shoot a lighter load, like a one ounce load, a lot faster. They like a one ounce load at about thirteen hundred feet per second. Um, and so in my gun in particular, that just it it. It, it, the bolt speed is just so high that it causes, it just causes all kinds of feed and, and extraction problems. Um, sometimes a magazine can't quite keep the rounds coming up fast enough to grab, or it doesn't quite, you know, the ejector doesn't quite play into it, all of those kinds of things. So I had issues that way. Um, I had some issues with, I, I tried another brand that was available there at the range. Um, that worked a little better, but it still had some malfunctions to it. Um, we, we found a gun shop and went to the gun shop and walked in and, and, and I about just had a heart attack cause they had Remington and federal ammo on the shelf. And we, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I about, woohoo. Right. And then, yeah, no kidding. And, and they didn't speak English. So we're, we're kind of going back and forth trying to understand one another and a non-Italian citizen cannot buy ammo from the gun store cause you have to have that Italian license. Oh man. So it just, it was, we got, we got hosed, bottom line, we got hosed by, uh, by ammo again, uh, in, in just getting it shipped over there. But I had a backup plan, right? So we know our ammo's not going to make it. Um, we're flying over. My, my girlfriend Karen's flying with me. So it's okay. We can take double the amount of ammo, blah, blah, blah. We'll even cheat on that a little bit. And, and I read on British Airways that all ammo has to be in a hard box, totally separate from all your other luggage, but it doesn't count against you as a, as a piece of luggage or the weight. Like for the quantity or for the weight? Well, for, for, for just luggage weight, right? Okay. So I make a gamble. I'm thinking, well, since it doesn't count, maybe we can slip a bunch of ammo. And I bought a toolbox, like a big DeWalt toolbox that locks. I'm like... Now, is it like a plastic toolbox or yeah. steel? Yeah, just like a big okay. plastic toolbox from, from Home Depot. Okay. It'll take locks, and I'm thinking, okay, I'll put a bunch of ammo in there. It'll, it'll definitely be overweight, but when I tell them it's two of us and it's the ammo on the side and their own rules say that the ammo's got to be on the side, maybe we'll sneak it by, right? And we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Which wound up being two hours at the gate or at the at – the, at the luggage check-in at the airport. What airport is this? This is Dulles in Washington at the British okay. Airways counter. So now you're in Utah. So did you make it from Utah to Dulles? <laughs> okay. So, so there needs to be a little explanation there. Karen, okay. Karen's parents live just outside of Washington in Warrington, Virginia. Okay. When we, we flew there, stayed overnight and then flew out of Dulles because on the way back, we're landing from the world shotgun shoot the week of the NRA world shooting championship and starlight three gun. So we, 
so when we traveled from Utah to, to uh, Dulles, I actually had two sets of guns, two sets of gear because I'm leaving half. I'm, I've got three gun gear that I've got to shoot that week when we come home. Plus all the gear I'm taking to, to Ipsic shotgun. Wow. So, yeah. So anytime, uh, one of the, the new people on like Facebook groups or Enos or something says, Hey, h- how is flying with guns? Like, come on. Craig goes with everything he's got in his safe. <laughs> Uh, you know, really, the only thing that I have problems with anymore is weight. You know, that really becomes your big thing in a, is just trying to keep the, the luggage under weight. So you don't, you know, yeah. don't pay out the nose for extra ship luggage charges. Yeah. But needless to say, they catch us with the stuff in the box. So we take all the extra ammo out and you're allowed 11 pounds, five kilograms of ammo per person. So Karen and I, I'm thinking we get 10 kilograms or 22 pounds. Well, British Airways says it's got to be in two different boxes. So, oh, so what amounts to 80, 80 rounds, 80 rounds of shotgun shells, roughly 80 rounds will be 11 pounds. So a little less than four boxes of shells per person. And they won't let me put it in one box. That's nothing. Exactly. Right. What the, here's the funny thing though. What they actually allowed us to do was take a backpack and I, I cut the, I cut two holes on either side of the zippers saying that the zipper went open. They allowed me to put four boxes of shells in a backpack alone with a lock on the zipper, like through the fabric of the zipper. And that was okay. But those four boxes couldn't go in a lockable plastic box <laughs> with another four boxes of ammo. Well, I mean, that, that makes total sense, Craig. Right. I think you're being unreasonable. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and I, at that point, I mean, it was, it was two hours of negotiating and, and it was funny. I mean, it was, I started off being pretty nice and, and trying to, you know, trying to make sure, Hey, you're get, You know, I didn't want to get in too deep because these people are going to say yes or no. And, uh, the lady who we're talking to is just the most illogical idiot bureaucrat that you could ever imagine. And, uh, Karen started getting irritated at her at one point. And I was like, Hey, you got to go for a walk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? the, only, the only way we're going to get out of this on the good side is by kissing ass and taking our lumps and then somehow convincing them that they're important. Yeah. She was going straight to throat slit. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's option two. Yeah. So anyway, um, that was, that was the ammo story, but the trip to Italy was fantastic. Wow. Um, so, so hang on, hang on a sec. Um, I want to back up just real quick. So how much, how many rounds of ammo did you actually get to take with you then from the United States? I, I took 160 rounds, which was, uh, the, basically the slugs and the buckshot that I needed, plus some extra slugs and buckshot to, to be able to shoot the match. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. Yep, that's about what we got over there. Um, and and uh, and before we get into how awesome the match was, how many stages? Thirty stages, five days of shooting. Wow. Yeah, five stages of sh- five days of shooting, thirty stages. Um, what was it like? Just a little over three hundred and eighty rounds, I think it was. Maybe almost four hundred for round count. Um, and you got to take one hundred and sixty with you. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and had to, I had, I had malfunctions on 19 to 30 stages. Oh man. So, so the shooting, my shooting sucked when, when, when it was running the slug stages and the buckstock stages, I I crushed, um, you know, I had, I had very good stages there and I had a few stages when the gun ran that were, were, were on par. Um, but yeah, the, the malfunctions just kind of ate us up. Well, and so I, I know, um, like I said, the new shooters and, are going to go back and listen to that other episode. The, uh, the, the people that have been with us the whole time know the story, but why don't you just give us a brief catch up of like what type of shotgun you're working with so we can, uh, relate to how sensitive it is to ammo. So, uh, I'm, I'm shooting a box fed shotgun. It's actually a firebird firearms TAC 12 a one, which it's loosely based off the, uh, well, it's called, it was called the actal 19 mark 1919. And now EAA is bringing it in. Um, but Jim takes a gun, and, and there's only a couple parts that are still stock parts. He makes an, uh, an aluminum upper, an aluminum lower, 
Uh, we remake the, the bolt carrier. We remake the, the whole entire gas system, all of those types of things for it. But it's a box-fed uh, gas gun, very much just AR ergonomics, uses an AR grip, AR stocks, uh, all of those kinds of things. Um, AR trigger? Uh, per, it's, it's an AR trigger, but the hammer, it has to be a little bit longer. So, okay. so we're running the, the lower half of the AR trigger group is, is just an A, you know, your base AR, uh, part. And then the hammer's a little bit longer and heavier just to, to make sure we get ignition on the, the ammo. And the gun works pretty good. Uh, if, if you run the stock five round or the stock 10 round magazines, um, no problem. When you want to start running some more magazine, you know, longer magazines, you have to kind of fiddle with the, uh, the mag springs so that they're strong enough to make sure you've got a, a round in place every time the bolt cycles. And then the, the, the bolt cycles, uh, pretty quickly. And so what we found was running exactly the opposite of what the Europeans like to do. I run an ounce and an eighth load at 1150 feet per second or 1200 feet per second and the, the gun runs like butter. It's, you know, it runs great. And so slowing that slide, that bolt down a little bit helps with the whole feed process. Um, but yeah, there's nothing real special to my gun. A lot of guys run mid barrel comps. Um, I went away from them a while back. I didn't really feel that they were giving me all that much and they decreased the dwell time. So the guns, the gun was a little bit more finicky with ammo. So I went with having a more reliable gun. And maybe a little bit more recoil, but I'm not really that recoil sensitive as it is. And so um, Makes sense. that's that's kinda kinda where I'm at with the gun setup. I run just a a, a a loophole delta point red dot on it and giddy up, you know, gas, gas <laughs> it up and let's go. Um T- Tim Ubel from Tatcom uh made some magazine extensions for both the five rounders that make them sixteen. And then he does a plus three rounder on the stock tens and they are money. Um, I've been running them for just the last couple months since he's been building them and they're awesome. So magazines are no longer an issue. Those are like 3d printed extensions, aren't they? Yeah. He's, he, so he has gone, he's gone crazy with his 3d printer. Um, I'm surprised he doesn't have a truck that he's 3d printed so far. (laughs) <laughs> but the, the, you know, Tim's for anybody that knows Tim's history, he's, you know, he's had a long history. He's, he was a designer and an engineer with JP and, and he did some work with Nordic and, and Tim's really been around this game and, and the sport and the guns for a long time. And, uh, you know, he started making the shell holders, which, which if nobody's seen the new magnetic shell holders, that they are bomber. Uh, there's a, yeah, I got to check those out at, uh, at nationals. They had their prototypes there. I was, it's pretty pretty surprised like how well they uh they stuck in there. It was kind of cool. There's there's a video of uh, Jay Carrillo on my Facebook page if anybody wants to look at it and he's actually got a loaded shell carrier and he's throwing it on his bed in the hotel room. He he's throwing it and just, you know, it's it's hitting and tumbling all over the place and shells aren't coming out. And then he grabs, Crazy. He grabs it. So, um well, and if you want to check that out, it's it's uh facebook.com/3gunconcepts, right? Craig Outson for the Facebook one. Oh, okay. Yep. Craig Outson, got it. But uh, anyway, Tim's gone crazy, and yeah, he's three D printed those uh, those magazine extensions. Um, before, what I was running was a kind of a mag coupler that took the five rounders, and then they coupled to a uh, a Sega twelve mag, and they were great. They were a reliable mag, uh, but the the, the Tacom's probably a little bit more user friendly as far as getting it set up. There's not quite as much tuning to do to it, and um, it's a little bit smoother to load. So yeah, it's uh, but but that that's always a big thing with with box fed guns too is, is is mags and their availability and mag capacity, and so Tim has really has really solved a couple of those problems. So it's much easier, uh, to to get into open a little bit. Okay, so we uh we covered your shotgun. We we got an idea of what what gear you're working with here. Nineteen stages of malfunctions out of thirty. So, so give us the, uh, give us a good picture of Italy. <laughs> this sounds like, uh, you know, it's a story that's going south. So let's, let's bring it back and, and talk about some cool things about the match. So, so cool things about the match is they've had three years to prep this match. The stages are spot on. There's, there's nothing on these stages that's going to be, 
um, a surprise. You're not going to get a freebie. You're not going to get be given anything. There's not some secret trap door in the stage that's going to allow you to shoot it faster. You simply have to step up to these stages, pick a good stage plan and execute. And you have to do it five days in a row. Um, it's tough. It is, it is incredibly hard. And the shooting is, um, initially a lot of, a lot of American shooters probably wouldn't enjoy it until they did it. If they saw the shooting or they saw the stages, they would probably be like, ah, I hate it. I hate it. When you actually shoot it, the challenge is so high that you, you gain an appreciation very quickly for it. But, but there's technical, technical shooting. Um, for instance, you'll have, a, a U.S. sized, a U.S. pepper popper, the small poppers, right? Right. You'll have a U.S. popper at, say, 12 yards, 15 yards away from the shooting position. It will be flanked by two other U.S. poppers in front of it. And so the actual, you know, the round part of the popper, the two, the two poppers in front will be no shoot poppers and they will actually, the, their circles will actually be just barely starting to encroach. On the on the shooting poppers circles, <laughs> nice. And, and so you've got two no shoots on either side of a shoot target, and so you have to know how high do you have to hold and offset how far to be able to hit that popper with with a portion of your pattern, just a portion of your pattern, in order to get it to not go in order to not get over, but not <coughs> pick up the no shoot penalty. Yeah, and just enough to knock it over. But, uh, exactly. And, and, and they give you enough room. And, and so not only do you have to know that, but you also have to know how to choose your, your chokes very well. Um, so that's one technical aspect of it. The second technical aspect of it is, is there will be shooting positions that are, that are very, uh, very restricted and very technical. Your feet, you have to hit your spots exactly on, um, you, you know, you may be on like an unstable teeter tottery platform and having to squat under a wall and still shoot target presentations like I described before. Um, so people go, well, I don't want to shoot a bunch of eight round stages. Ipsic has a rule that there's got to be two eight round stages for every one 16 round stage. And there's got to be two 16 round stages for every one 32 round stage. So guys are like, well, I don't want to shoot a lot of eight round stages, but the eight round stages were actually some of the, the most fun because they're some of the most technically demanding. Well, and they're super fast too. So they, they count for a lot mm -hmm. over overall in the match, right? Right. Um, well, the longer stage, yeah, the, the little stages count a huge amount because when you start to hit factor scoring, um, you know, not very much of a change really, really can be change your hit factor. Whereas on a little longer stage, there's a little more cushion before they, they really affect your stage score. Um, so they're, they're really technical. They're really, they're really hard to shoot. Um, some of them are fun. There's, they, they're, it looked like a lot of, a lot of no shoots, a ton of no shoots. And we generally don't see a lot of that in three gun, like no shoots around uh, shotgun targets. It, there was, uh, there's, there's probably, probably a good 50 to 60% of the targets you shot were danger targets of some sort or another. Huh? Um, so, so now the, the no shoot does, they're so describe it like they're generally steel. Would that be an, an accurate statement? Oh yeah. So, so most everything that you're shooting with, with birdshot, um, generally you'd only see paper on the buckshot and slug stages. So everything else is knock over steel. There's some clays. Um, there's some activating targets. There's some swinging targets with clays in them, things like that. Uh, but, but the largest portion is, is knock over steel. Now the, uh, the the no shoots does a does a pellet strike count or does it have to be fallen? It, so they paint so you don't touch a target at, at the international Leipzig. They have people paid to reset the stage, and so sweet exactly. It's it's pretty awesome that way. Lots more bullshit and then grab assery time, right? <laughs> um, it, well, yeah, and you know that that likely helps with the uh, stamina for maintaining your energy for a, a five day match as well. Right. Um, so we got a lot more time to visit and, and goof off in different languages, but, but a, a, <laughs> a knocked over no shoot only counts if there's a pellet mark on the front of it. So if, if you, t if it hits, if three or four pellets hit it, but don't knock it over, it doesn't count. 
Uh, okay. And conversely, if if it goes over, or let's say a piece of steel, uh, you know, a steel piece still behind it knocks it over or whatever, and when the ROs are scoring, they go look at the front of it, and there's not a pellet mark on the front of it. It's it's not a it's not a it doesn't count against it's not a penalty. Now is this like a like a USPSA type match here in the US where you would follow the uh, the RO and the timer around to make sure that you guys all yep. uh, concur? Okay. Yeah, and that's one of the things that's very the, – the ROs are, are all very good. Um, for each section, there was five sections at the match, so you shot one section per day. Uh, each section has a supervising RO, so if you have an issue, you call your – you know, you talk to the RO. If it doesn't get resolved, they call over the supervising RO, and then if they can't resolve it, it goes, it goes right up. So they've got a good chain of command. Everybody's pretty much on point. Uh, the ROs are all very good at the rules. Um, it's all, you know, having having 700 people shoot a match of all kinds of different nationalities, languages, and all of that, they really put a lot of effort into to not only having the rules set up right, but abiding by the rules. Um, that way it's, it's kind of easy for everybody, you know, or at least take some variables out that way. So, okay, the... This this sounds like super interesting, and there's you know five sections that you're shooting from, uh-huh. so that's what six stages a day, right? right? So we're talking about a range that has thirty bays. Yep. Now, okay, so my you know my totally xenophobic, closed off view of the world is that like the United States is the only one that have guns, and then any other country that does is that in some kind of uh, conflict, right? So the now, what what are the what are the ranges like? What is the range like that has thirty bays? So, uh, Italy's a little bit difficult with pistol because they can't have nine by nineteen. They can't have military calibers, uh, but you can have thirty eight super or nine by twenty one. So they still have IPSC matches. So this particular uh, this particular range had probably I don't know fifteen to eighteen pistol bays in one section. Huh. And then the other section of this range is actually a big uh, shotgun range. So they had uh, a big international trap range with the traps down in ground level bunkers. And what they did to make uh, shotgun stages was they just brought in huge uh, bales of straw. You know, you see the big uh, hay bales that are like four foot wide by six to eight feet long and, you know, another four feet thick. Is that like the big rolls? Not, yeah, not like the big rolls, but think of the big rectangular ones. Not not, okay, a, okay. not a small rectangular bale, but the big industrial size rectangular bales of, of straw. And gotcha. and they built they built uh, they essentially built berms out of those between stages. Huh, all, that's pretty cool. All the way up and down the trap field, so that was another you know that was another eighteen to twenty bays that we shot on. Got it. So they put temporary berms to expand the uh, the capacity. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Yep. So they what what range they didn't have for base, they built base for it. That's so cool. And, and then it was <laughs> you know it was a cool little place. Italy's Italy's really cool. So the match is really cool. It's very technical. Um, ROs are good. You're getting to BS with all kinds of people from all over the world. Uh, you know, it, it's it's really. Everybody's seen a seen the video of uh, Larry Vickers' video when he's in Russia shooting with the Spetsnaz guys, and and the, and the one guy's <laughs> taking rounds in the chest, right? Mm-hmm. The guy's name's Andre Kirisenko, and so we've shot together. We shot together at the first World Shoot, and we shot together at the Pan Americans in Kentucky, and we we shot next to each other uh, at this match. And he's a great dude. He loves to joke, you know. I mean, it, it, we just have a good time, and so you're meeting you're meeting all kinds of people. Um, Oleg from from the Ukraine is owns a software company. He's actually doing a lot of the software for Obamacare. So we had all kinds of things to talk about. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you just you, you get a lot of time to just meet folks and, and chat, and, and they're from all over the world. So it's it's socially, it's one of the neatest things you'll ever do. And uh, it from from what I've seen, it sounds like you uh, you got to know a lot of great jokesters. Throughout the uh, the world, too, trying to get translations for punchlines and stuff like that. Oh, dude, it's 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 funny because well, I, you probably saw the picture on my my Facebook page where uh, Oleg Oleg's actually translating something that Andre's saying out of Russian, and he actually he actually stops and he says, 
I don't think I can go any further with this because it's pretty offensive. <laughs> I'm like, ah, let's have it. Yeah, it, keep going. And it was offensive, but it was funny. So <laughs> <laughs> funny always wins, right? Funny always wins. So, you know, I mean, it, it's great from that standpoint. Um, the range is actually really nice. I mean, where, where in, where in the U S do you go to a range and you, you get cappuccinos in the morning? Uh, yeah. And I'm not talking like kind of a cappuccino. I'm talking like one of the best cappuccinos you've ever had. You know, um, the range food was incredible. Every day you had your choice of some roasted meats and some like two or three different pastas and, uh, things like that. They had a whole beer truck and, and food cart that was there. So as soon as the shooting was over, you could start drinking beer and hanging out with all your buddies. Um, so it, it's just, you know, it's a neat experience. Everybody's there for the same reason. And the neat thing about shotgun, a lot of people don't understand this is Ipsic pistol is probably a lot like USPSA pistol where there's a lot of kind of people are a little bit too uptight. And, and the three gunners, <laughs> what would be the three gunners of the world, a bunch of characters and a bunch of people screwing off and having grab assery everywhere is world shotgun. That's, that's where, that's where all those characters gravitate who don't fit in with world Ipsic. They wind up in world shotgun. Why do you think that is? Um, I think to a certain extent with three gun and the world shotgun, um, I think it's because people take it less seriously as in it's not as legitimate and in not taking it as legitimate, there's all those people who are just as good as shooters, but they're like, yeah, I don't care. It's, it's not the legitimacy that's attracting me. I don't, I don't need the rubber stamp, uh, of, of approval. I'm just here to have fun and shoot. So I think that's kind of what's driven that for world shotgun. And I think it probably drove that in the early years with three gun and the outlaw, the early outlaw matches and and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a good point. It it does seem like there, there is a lot more emphasis placed upon like a, uh, a pistol win or a, a pistol championship than there really is on three gun. Like most guys take that and, you know, pat themselves on the back and then go home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, not to dog it or anything like that. Just, um, it just, just Oh no, not dog it at all. Just just different, interesting type of, uh, you know, just different, different sports. Basically. Everybody hears about the world pistol shoot. Everybody hears, hears about us nationals, you know, and three gun has grown in the last few years, but, but, you know, if you watched Shooting USA or Shooting Gallery or anything, maybe any any further than four to five years ago, you didn't hear anything about Three Gun. Maybe a little teeny blurb here and there, but you always saw the pistol stuff. So I think a lot of that kind of, you know, the notoriety being a little lower or whatever, um, all of those kinds of things kind of, kind of maybe makes it to where the characters show up. Do you think that maybe had something to do with like the, uh, the political climate of like the assault weapons ban of the nineties. And, you know, maybe it wasn't, you know, people were afraid to show that on, on television or afraid to, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure there was probably some aspect of that. I'm sure too, that, um, 10 years ago, I bought my first AR 10 or maybe 12 years ago. And there was, you know, there was only four or five companies that sold ARs. There was Armalite, there was Colt, there was Bushmaster, and there was DPMS. And, yeah. um, and, you know, Rock River was there, but nobody really knew how to buy one from them. Um, there was a couple. <laughs> yeah, no, you, if you went to a gun show, yeah, I, I kid you not, right? It was like, if you went to a gun show, you might see some ARs at the gun show, but not really. And so, and, and then the models were such that, you know, nothing was made for a three gunner. Yeah. And and you look at the change from there till now. So just in that 10 years time, if you just look at the popularity, right? There nobody really knew how to show an SOF match on TV. Yeah. So so Craig, you shoot for Rainier Arms and this is going to totally sound like a uh, a planned product placement. Uh-huh. I, guarantee, I guarantee it is not. <laughs> I heard uh John Huang on a uh um uh, podcast. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. I heard him on a podcast where, um, you know, he, it was a business podcast and he's talking about like how he grew Rainier Arms and stuff like that. And one of the comments that he said was that the, um, the gun market was so 
anti-internet and had no clue how to use the internet that it opened up the door for him to just take he said all i did was take nice pictures and put a description and we excelled so far amongst even the manufacturers in that area Uh and and it's absolutely true no it so like my relationship and i didn't know this but my relationship started with rainier arms long long time ago and um I, i can't remember what i was buying but i was buying kind of a nondescript part couldn't find it did a google search this place called rainier arms comes up and so i ordered it from them and their website was pretty good it was much better than websites at that time but they didn't have very many products but but like you said, there was a product there and there was a description and it had price and blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, like the specs. And it was like, wow, these guys have it going on. And and oddly enough, like something happened with the shipping or, or something along those lines that I had to make a phone call to customer service. And I actually called and talked to Ari. And he was like, hey, really, really sorry. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. You know, he's like, you know, what can we do to make it right? And I'm like, oh, I'm not asking for anything special. It just, you know, I just want what I got or whatever, you know? And then I started buying more and more stuff from them. And, you know, whenever I needed something, they always kind of had it. And, uh, so it it started a long time before we had ever entertained the idea of of me shooting for them. And I I agree with him a hundred percent. I still agree with him in a lot of firearms marketing. Firearms marketing keeps revolving around either we dress a guy up in, you know, he's got to be a bearded coast guard dolphin uh, you know, <laughs> ready, ready to kill, or we dress a guy up like Elmer Fudd going to kill Bambi. Those are the two, those are the two marketing themes you have in firearms. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't caught on to, um, you know, I, there's a few companies that are starting to, but, but yeah, I, I think that's a lot of it. The, the firearms industry was mom and pop gun shops. One of the coolest things that I've seen, or as far as like marketing goes in the firearms industry, I believe it was PWS, but it was, and I think it was for their modern musket, but it showed like a, like a father, a mother, small child going out to shoot, all had their ears on, all had their eyes on and just happy, you know, and there was no nefarious, um, you know, zombies coming at them. And, you know, it wasn't like they were geared up for the end of the world or anything. It was just like going out and having like decent fun like all of us do so right i mean uh, yeah and that (laughs) and it's crappy how much that stood out as far as like oh this is very unique yeah that they show an everyday situation hey what what people just go and shoot and have fun no they've got to be they've got (laughs) to be training to be a you know anyway we we know what we're talking about it's 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 totally believable and those guys like john who had a vision and could see a different direction to go are the ones that you see now that are, that are, are being successful in a soft market. Um, yeah, for sure. um, they're, you know, three years ago, four years ago, everybody was successful because, because the market would support damn near anything, right? The market was just going crazy, but absolutely the last couple of years have been pretty soft. And so you only see those guys who are able to kind of see an Avenue. And that's, I mean, that's what's totally impressive about me with, with John and Paul and Ari and those guys, uh, they just do so many things really well and they're kind of seeing things. They were some of the first guys to start designing parts that were not only functional parts, but realizing that the design and the visualization of those parts was important too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've talked about the compensator or whatever, you know, a ball cut here, just style what that was important. And you look at that with Fortis's Fortis manufacturing's uh, forearms or some of the stuff that's that Rainier's doing for their own parts. And, um, you know, that's what's keeping them kind of successful and going forward. Yeah. And, and their, you know, their market of, you know, high end AR 15 parts, you know, certainly fits like that sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, that sort of mantra as well and why they're working in a soft market here because they're selling unique stuff that people want. And you've got a couple, uh, uh, photos of, uh, on your Instagram of, uh, some Rainier, like lower receivers and upper receivers right? and they're good looking pieces. It's nice to see like non mill spec parts like, Oh, we can make this look decent too. That's exactly it. Um, yeah, it looks good. If it, it still functions great, it's still got parts compatibility, but it looks good. And, and you know, what's kind of neat is I've, I've talked with this with a few people that, are, that do some stuff around the industry and I see a lot of, 
you know, everybody kind of wants to discount them. Um, but you, let, let's call them skater kids, you know, Gen Xers that are into the X Games, whatever. You know, I don't know what the exact title is because I don't want to really be offensive to anybody. But let's talk. I think that I think Gen Xers are like my age, man, like 30, <laughs> late, uh, mid 30s. I guess I'm 35. So I, I think you got to go like millennials or something. OK, so let's let's talk maybe just a little bit older millennials. You know, let's let's whatever demographic hits those 20 to 30 year old kids. There you go. Um They've grown up with with a bunch of, of subjective sports that didn't have hard rules to them that, you know, were kind of free-floating. And so there there isn't a single shooting sport that's going to appeal to those guys with respect to, you know, going trap shooting, going shooting, bench rest, or, you know, something like that. And not to dog those sports, but it's just they're very etiquette-driven. They're very, they're very traditionalized. They're very, you know – Kind of very staunch. There's a there's a whole whole pro- process to go to them, but three gun is really attractive. And furthermore, having an AR and just going and shooting and having fun is attractive. Having a pistol and just going and shooting and having fun is attractive. So having something stylized, having a product that is easily customized, the way they've grown up and never known what a rotary phone is. They, well, and, and, but what, where I'm going is, is every phone they've ever had, they could buy another color for the cover. They can get a different app. If they want a different picture for the background, they change it. If the, you know, and so they never were, they never were young when, Hey, you want a black phone or you want a white phone? And it goes on your wall right there. You know, that, damn it, Craig, that is the perfect (laughs) analogy because, you know, I'm picturing like my, I'm pretty sure my like my parents had one, but for some reason, like my grandma Hartman's uh, rotary phone yeah. that was black, sitting there in the corner. Like when you say rotary phone, whatever comes in your mind is that exact phone that was sitting there. That, that, and when you, yeah, when you think of like uh, you know M16 or Air 15 or something like that, in your head you have like pictured the mil spec, mm-hmm. you know, the long barrel, the carry handle, or something like that. And yeah, you're exactly right. Like, but when you just say phone, now you're talking like a wide variety of different things, and that's what the AR market has turned into, dude. That's a, well, did you come up with that yourself? Of course. No, that's no, amazing. no, no. Well, well, in a in a different in, in, in a different light, you know, I was just thinking about it right now. But when you start looking at it, and with respect to what, and, and like I, I'll, I'll use Rainier Garms for example, because I love plugging those guys. Those guys are just awesome. But but plenty of companies are doing this. But when you give when you give that person who's who's twenty five or thirty, they buy a product and you and you tell them no, you can't change anything on it. They don't even understand that concept. So oh, yeah. Rainier Arms Avalanche uh, charging handle, for instance, to not only be able to shape change the shape of the handles, but to be able to change the colors, to be able to anodize it and set it off to have a black gun with red handles or to have a blue gun with gray hand, whatever, right? That's exactly what there's this whole generation that we're missing marketing to. That's exactly what they expect. If they want a color of a grip or they want a forearm in a different color or different shape or different cutouts, that's, I think that's kind of the future or, or should be where people are really looking uh, to expand some stuff. How, how many, how many 18 inch long rifles can you buy with the same handguard? Yeah, you know, for sure. Before you want a different color, before you want a different, you know, uh, you know, talked with with Warren Mounts and, and Randy and, and, you know, they we've got some really cool looking colors. Their new charcoal colors really good looking. Um, yeah, I actually simple, won simple. a certificate for a Warren Mount um, like three months ago. And the only reason I haven't sent it off is I haven't decided what color I want to get. <laughs> It's now paralysis by analysis. Right? You know, they they've got so many cool options. Every time I go there, it's it's uh, you know, they've got another one. So and there, yeah, it, it's it's interesting, Craig, that that market and the customization and stuff like that. And I know this, you know, sounds like a, you know, a five minute long Rainier spot, and it, I promise <laughs> it's not. I'm just like a I'm just a John Wong fanboy or, yeah. or something. But but uh, you know, I really admire what they've done in in the uh, market. But yeah, all you got to do is scroll through Instagram and you see, you know, 17 different safeties every day and, you know, 18 different, um, you know, selectors. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the customization is definitely there. And and why shouldn't it be, right? Because that's. Why not? This is America. And that's, 
I think that's really kind of where the, the, the big firearms, you know, if you talk of, you know, big firearms marketing, I think that's where they missed it. So you see all of these smaller companies really starting to pick up on what we're talking about and they're doing a great job. You know, they're doing a great job of, of making products, whether it be to customize something or, or, you know, just make it your own, change the color. Sure, it doesn't make any difference function wise. And we can argue about that on the internet all we want, but what does that matter? You know? Yeah, if you like it, I, why not? I've got money. I'm shooting it. I want it to look cool. I tell you the, uh, you know, when you talk about the big four that you were speaking of earlier, the, uh, the company that has made the biggest leap recently as far, as far as going from that staunch hold, you know, carry handle, 18 inch irons, to like a you know like a modern rifle is Armalite. Well, okay, and and I'll use this as an example because because I love this guy. So one of their one of their guys in their designer de- design department is Nate, and got some crazy hair, got some ta- Craig, got some tats. Craig, Craig. yeah, sorry about it. You broke out oh. real quick right after you said Nate's name. Oh, sorry. So so Nate's there at Armalite, and he's in their design department. And he's, you know, he's got some facial piercings and some tattoos and, and stereotypically somebody might look at him and say, that guy owns a gun, but he has brought, you know, some of the style stuff just to Armalite. Not only do you have, not only do you have Tommy's business savvy and, and some of the other guys that brought these, these cool functional designs where Armalite had kind of gone stagnant and hadn't developed anything. They, they came back and they brought state of the art function in. You know, state of the art 13 inch gun that's, that's built, purpose built for base stage three gunning. You know, 18 inch long three gun model, purpose built for, you know, any other type of outlaw three gunning. But then you have this kid who's got this cool sense of style and they're like, do whatever you want with them. And so they've got really good looking receivers and really good looking hand guards. And, and that you couple that guy who does, you know, you couple somebody there who does the engineering on a, a really effective comp with a guy who's got a really good eye for style and making something cool, holy, why wouldn't they be hitting home runs? They're crushing it. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's cool to see that stuff. And I know that, uh, you know, with the, uh, you know, the change of the helm there with Tommy Thacker in charge, that we have a lot to thank Tommy for, for, for that. But it's cool to see that type of creativity, mm-hmm. you know, encouraged and enriched and, you know, promoted within, within a, you know, company that's, you know, what, over a hundred years old? They invented 60 years old. Yeah. They invented the gun, right? Exactly. So <laughs> what, what does AR stand for again? Oh yeah. Armalite. Yeah. And so, you know, how, how cool is that, that, that they went, uh, you know, they're a big boy that kind of went stagnant, kind of, you know, weren't really doing anything on the edge of development and they come back and, and they've just got these awesome cutting edge designs going down. Oh, for sure. It's, it's a really cool time to, uh, to be in the industry and in the, in the sport and, and, you know, be a, con- or at least, you know, be a consumer in the sport or a consumer in the industry because there's so many options out there. Yeah. Which, which Craig bring, brings me to, you know, a, a question and we've kind of gone all over the place here, but brings me to a question that I wanted to ask you. But first, you know, you and I have been on the phone for, uh, like an hour and 20 minutes now. How are you doing on time? I'm, I'm, I've got all the time in the world, man. Okay. Okay. Cause I, I feel like this is like a good transition and it'd be perfect time to ask you, but I, you know, I, I don't, I want to be respectful of your, uh, Saturday evening here. No but worries. There is a serious abundance of options in the market right now. So imagine if you will, like we've got a three gunner has been, you know, shooting for one or two years. They brought out like, you know, their M4 style, just, you know, their Glock 17 or their Sigma or whatever, Uh whatever they had and like a, you know, pump shotgun looking to upgrade all that stuff and make like a, like a serious effort. They want to commit to three gun. What do you see as like a good setup for three gun rifle, pistol, shotgun wise? And we can talk about ancillary gear too, but, but, uh, let's kind of keep it toward maybe tack ops because that seems to be like the largest volume of shooters. As far as divisions goes, easy, easy, easy to do. Um, let, let's let's talk attack op setup. Um, easiest thing for a pistol, uh, and and we'll keep it kind of budget minded right off the get go. Okay. So, uh, Glock thirty four, Glock thirty four with a trigger and some sights. 
get, get you the base pads of your choice. Obviously, I think Taryn's probably crushing it with the base pads as far as the quality and, and the, the number out there and how they're working. And so, oh, for sure. so you know, buy you some Terran tactical base pads. Yep, your mag capacity. You got four mags with 23 rounds a piece in them, 24 rounds, whatever your mags wind up holding. You've got a gun with a decent trigger, you know, and, and, and the sights of your choice. You know, there's lots of good sights out there, but hey, you bought the base pads at Terran's place. Might as well buy the sights. Now, that sounds pretty, uh, well, you can get a trigger at Terran's too, which is kind of cool. Yep. But that sounds pretty basic. You know, we don't need like, you know, super gold slide and, <laughs> you know, lightning cuts and stuff you, like that. You, or You do not need a $3,000 plastic gun. You, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you, you're going to make me say names. Um, no, it, it's, <laughs> don't do it's, it. It's one of those things, right? Um, is, is there some advantage to a, to a 2011 type setup? Some people would argue yes, but, uh, you know, there's also an advantage to the Glock and the striker fired gun. Getting rid of that gun in three gun, uh, gun transitions are really important and being able to put that gun in a bucket without having to manipulate a safety, without having to empty the gun, um, is a huge advantage. And it's, it's very, you know, it helps the beginning shooter a little bit with their stage planning because it gives them one less thing to worry about. And it helps the big boy shooter, uh, you know, the fast guy with a little bit because they can, they can actually take advantage of that time. So I, I like the plastic gun option and, and I, I prefer Glocks, but you know what? I mean, there's a, an FNS, uh, a Smith and Wesson MMP, you know, take, take your pick of the plastic striker fired gun. Um, this, oh yeah. They've, they've got a, the, the MMP, what is it? The uh, core or something like that. It's like their long slide. And then they have, the FNS even has a long slide now, FNS 9L or something like that. Right. So, and then I think Springfield even has a competition model. Uh, the, okay, so we'll throw the XD in there. And the reason I bring those up is is because when we talk open, get one of the Glock uh, MOS guns that where you can mount a red dot on it or the Smith & Wesson yeah. core. Still, yeah. again, you're in open and you get, you get 90%, 90, 95% of the advantages of – of the open gun optic and, and stuff like that without the, some of the open gun headache, for instance. Okay. So we're, we're starting out with, uh, with the simplest. Then we've got, you know, say for just for simplicity, say Glock 34, we've got good sights on there. We upgraded the trigger, um, and some, uh, some base pads and with four mags, probably get yourself a holster, a couple of mag pouches. Now. So from there, What's the next simplest thing to work, shotgun or rifle? So shotgun has gotten, uh, you know, shotguns or shotguns are pains in the butt, but shotgun has gotten a little easier. And honestly, I think the best competition model out there uh, for a new guy to get into is is the Remington competition model. Um, it it comes with, I, I prefer the Versus Max just because it's got the longer loading port, which makes co- loading with duels and quads a little bit easier because it's a little bit longer. The shells don't kink as much going in. But that gun comes completely set up for the new shooter. They've It's already got sights installed. It comes with a couple of sights. It's already got choke tubes. It's already, you know, the, the extended tube isn't necessarily the best because it, it's only it only holds 10 and some guys prefer 12. but at the end of the day out of the box a new shooter can go shoot that gun in a match and not have much of a hindrance at all maybe they want wind up doing a little bit of port work but that's about it and the other thing is is its price point again is down there was a used one on on uh gun broker yesterday because i'm looking for a buddy there was a used one on gun broker yesterday for 949 dollars and the guy had bought it. It was like less than a hundred rounds, and he so less than a thousand dollars, and it was a fully set up three gun rig. Wow! And I yeah, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good price point, right? And so, and I don't, you know, I know some of the Stogers, uh, you know, Tom's Hart's doing a, a, I don't know what his competition model comes out with, but you know, there's a couple other guns in that category, but not near at that price point. And when we talk on the other end, you know, if, they, if somebody wants a Terran Benelli fantastic gun but the price point's getting kind of prohibitive for that brand new guy to to drop 2500 bucks on a on a new shotgun right and uh just just to back up uh 
briefly because we had a, a Skype cut out again. You said that uh, the Remington comes with a 10-round tube, and some guys like to do 12 rounds. Is that right? Right. The Remington comes with a tube that holds eight, and it's got a little tube extension oh. on it that, that okay. takes it to 10. Um, so a lot of guys wind up replacing that with like a four-round extension so you can get to 12. 12 just tends to be that a, a much better number uh, for, for when you get around a stage and you have to load more or less. Um, sometimes when you have that shorter tube, like 10, you'll get to where you've got room to load eight rounds, but you haven't actually shot enough shells out of the gun yet to load all eight. So 12 tends to be just a little bit more desirable than the 10 round tube. But the flip side is, is you're getting a gun with, with slug sights, uh, you know, that shoots well, that tends to be one of the better functioning guns in the sport that tends to be a, you know, good value tends to enough people have it that, we kind of know what the issues are with it, or we know how to fix things with it. Um, I, I think it's, you know, I think it's a really good way to go. And so now we've done a pistol and a shotgun at roughly about a thousand bucks a piece. And so, okay. so we're keeping that nice uh, new guy as financially friendly as we can be, but still getting him into stuff that he's not going to be fighting his gear. Gotcha. So, sp- so speaking of fighting your gear, um, you know, in the last episode that we, we, uh, did together, we talked about how shotguns are finicky and each of them has their own little quirks and, um, um, idiosyncrasies that you need to take care of. So when you get that Remington out of the box, can you give me like one, two, three things that you need to do? Like before you even start shooting, like these are definitely going to hinder your game. Um, actually I would say that the only thing that will hinder your game is depending on how you're going to load the gun you might want to open the port, other the loading port. Other than that, okay. um, you know, and there's dozens of places on the internet to go look at that. If somebody wants to get a hold of me, I've actually got kind of an email that I've got saved up that I send people that just kind of gives them a step-by-step way to do it. Um, Greg Fittis, just a shooter from California, walked him through it, and now he's done a bunch of them for all of his buddies. They're very simple to do on your own, but even if you, you know, even if you paid somebody to open up that port a little bit, um, you know, it might be a hundred, 150 bucks to have your local guy kind of get it in the mill and, and do a little work with it. But other than that, that gun is, that gun's totally functional. As a matter of fact, I've, I've got a new guy here local to me that I've been working with for the last few months and he wound up, that's, that's the gun he decided to go with. Um, I cut the port on it. We've done nothing else to the gun. He actually just went and shot the surefire multi-gun match and he had no problems nothing whatsoever you know shot the gun made all of his slug hits was able to load the gun within his skill set all of that everything was good to go very cool and and that's that's what you want right is for your your gear not to be a hindrance and for you to shoot to your level of ability yeah there's so there's so many things to be learning as a new guy shooting three gun there's so many things to keep track of and all of that it's so much nicer if you've got gear that runs and is reliable and and furthermore is kind of easy to set up because you don't have the knowledge yet to know what you don't know and know what you want versus what you don't want. Um, so it's so easy. You know, that's why I like the guns and stuff that we pick so far because the choices have already been made for that new shooter. Ultimately, maybe that new shooter will want something different, but for the time when they're, you know, when they're new to the sport, their first few matches, the, the problem is not going to be their gear. They, they picked gear that's going to take them a long way into the sport before they decide they have to change it. I like it. And I like where you're heading with this, uh, this concept. So, um, then we're going to get some, uh, some quad loaders, you know, like we said, there's AP, there's TACOM, there's carbon arms, probably forgetting like four of them, but we're going to get some, uh, you know, load twos or load fours for your, uh, your belt setup. Now let's move on to, uh, to rifle. What, what type of, uh, rifle are we going to do and hey here's a good question are you going to buy your rifle or are you going to build your rifle so i, I actually had this question asked today in in uh in some texts and generally what i tell people is is you're probably not going to build you know you might be able to build a rifle if you pick any given price point you'll probably be able to build a little nicer rifle and by nicer i mean you know you can choose the grip you can choose the stock you can choose the fore end that you want um, and maybe get something a little more high speed or sexy looking, but you're probably not going to make something that really, really outperforms a, another rifle. 
unless you unless you jump that price point quite a bit. So building your rifle, I'm a I'm a fan of building your rifle because you actually kind of learn a little bit more about how the rifle works and what it's doing and what's going on, and that's always an advantage. But uh, for a guy's first rifle, there's also a huge advantage to uh, to picking something off the shelf that's going to serve the purpose really well, going to be reliable, um, and allow them to learn where they don't have to to worry about the gun, worry about its performance, worried about its, its, um, you know, function or anything like that. Okay. Okay. So we're buying a rifle and, uh, there, there are an abundance right now of, uh, three gun rifles on the market. And there's also a lot of rifles that say three gun on them that does not seem like they chose the best components. So how, (laughs) so how does one then, uh, decide like is this a three gun rifle or does it just say three gun on it I, you know we, we've mentioned some some things uh to to date that are that are there um everybody's you're right everybody's trying to get into this three gun deal um armalite we already mentioned i think that's an awesome setup um in the sense that and, and i remember talking to tommy about this was you know kind of the idea behind that rifle was hey if tommy and greg are shooting it and you want to buy the same rifle Tommy and Greg are shooting, you can buy that rifle from Tommy and Greg. They'll go grab one off the rack and go out shooting it the next day. Yeah. Um, and, and so when you set that rifle up, it's, I mean, it's incredibly well set up. But, again, it's the same type of rifle that would be easy for a guy to replicate if he wanted to build it, or it's also the same setup across the board uh, where you can find some rifles. So what I tell a guy to look for is for that first rifle, and we've talked about this before, I would, I really prefer an 18 inch barrel with a rifle length gas system. Um, okay. Get, and c- can you briefly tell us why? So the gun is, so across the, across the gas system lengths, a rifle length gas system is going to shoot smoother and be more reliable than any of the others. That doesn't mean the others can't be made reliable or that they're junk. It just means that the brass is going to be getting extracted under less pressure out of the out of the uh, chamber, which is going to make the gun recoil a little bit less. It's also going to make it a little bit more reliable because we're not trying to jerk it with like with a carbine link tube, that gas pressure that's still in the chamber, pushing the brass against the walls of the chamber is still much higher than in a rifle link. So we're, we're extracting under a much greater force. Gotcha. Increased recoil, increased chance that just with any time we put more force on something to do it, there's going to be an increased chance of it malfunctioning. So I really, for that first rifle for a guy, I really prefer an 18-inch barrel or a 20-inch barrel, you know, a, a medium to light contour barrel with a rifle length gas system. Okay. I'm not a big guy that thinks receiver sets matter all that much. Um if, if we start dealing with unlimited budgets, then yes, the, the fully, you know, forged, carved out of a billet of granite receiver sets um, <laughs> can make a little bit of difference. But remember, most of the billet receiver sets are heavier, too. So remember, we're still trying to keep a, a light gun. So right. so I'm I'm a pretty big fan of, of either building that rifle off of a, you know, a mil-spec receiver set or at least not shying away from a rifle that's built on your basic forged mil-spec receiver set. Pick out, a, okay. pick out a good trigger. Um, you know, I, I love hyper fires. They're mechanically, I think they are the better mousetrap. And I think you can make a good physical mechanical argument for that. But there are still plenty of, of triggers out there that are really good. Timneys are excellent. And those guys bend over backwards for this sport. You know, um, they were at starlight. They, they, they run around everywhere. They make a good trigger. Um, Elf, Elfman triggers are, I really like the feel of those Elfman triggers. They're really nice. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot of people are making nice triggers, but pick out a trigger that you like that's within your budget because the trick, I sh- trigger's going to be very, very important. I shoot a, uh, a Geisley three gun, which I, I like quite a bit. And then, uh, I shoot with a bunch of guys that have AR gold. So those are a couple more options there. Yeah. AR golds and Geisleys. I mean, there's, like I said, there's, there's a plethora of, of really good triggers out there. Their function is all going to be pretty much top notch. Um, and, and I always, I always start with this when people ask me about triggers, I tell them what I like, but trigger feel is very subjective. Um, go to a match, ask to feel guys triggers. 
you know, the, I, the AR gold trigger break is fantastic. I don't like the reset because the reset isn't very strong. Some guys are totally okay with that, but that's totally a subjectable, a subjective judgment on my part. But, but field triggers, find one that you like. Um, Geisley super dynamic three gun. I, I ran a bunch of those for a long time. Um, I really like the strong reset feel. The brakes may be a little on the, on the mushy side compared to some, but it's a, it's still a, it's a fantastic trigger. So. Yeah. And, and any of those options that we said are going to be like a, a huge step up from a mil spec trigger. And, uh, and I know that from experience. If, if the first thing that I would tell guys when they, when they want to improve a gun, I think the most bang for the buck is a trigger improvement. Regardless of the gun they brought, if they brought their M forgery to the match and they had a hard time and they're like, Oh, I need to change this and that about everything. I think the most bang for the buck that they're going to get with respect to rifle is putting a good trigger in it. All right. So we, we've got the, uh, the trigger down. We're going to get like mil spec receiver sets because the, uh, save, the... save a couple shekels for our trigger, right? Right, right. Uh, what else we got, Craig? I, I have no problem for that first gun. Uh, we're doing a rifle like gas system. Go ahead and go with a, a full weight. You know, if you want to do a light carrier, that's fine. Uh, if you want to get into a, a, an adjustable gas block and a light carrier, but my suggestion for that new shooter is, is go with, uh, you know, and you can go a carbine length stock, but go with a full weight bolt carrier group and, and run the full weight buffer and, uh, that come, that's appropriate for the stock length you choose. The reason being is now we've got a gun that's pretty much in its design parameters of the, how the gun operates. So that way, as we're learning, we know how the gun runs and we know that it's going to function. So then we know that if our reloads aren't working in it, it's probably our reloads. It's not that our gas block came out or that we're running too light of a buffer, or too heavy of a buffer, or blah, you know, all of these kinds of things. That gives us a nice middle of the road gun that we can we can determine how to grow with it. And as we shoot, then we can start, if we want to make an improvement of a light bolt carrier or an adjustable gas block or start tuning the gun's recoil a little bit, we'll actually have gained some knowledge to know where we're starting and where we're going to. Um, but that gun is going to be, you know, we could build that gun that we just talked about where there's there's several guns on the on the commercial marketplace that we can build that gun for around a thousand bucks, eleven hundred dollars. We can put a really good barrel on it that's going to last us a long time. We can put a really good trigger on it that's going to help us shoot better. And then those parts that we that we might wind up replacing, those are easily changed, and we can tune the gun over time to be a little more in line with our skill set and our knowledge base as we grow in the sport. So now we've got three guns, we've got our belt set up. And we're, we're probably roughly about $3,000, maybe $3,200, $3,300. Um, and all we've got left is to choose a budget for an optic and away we go. <laughs> and, and that's kind of the, uh, the kicker right there because, you know, there's, there's options now, like from the Vortex Strike Eagle. That's, I think it's like 350 bucks straight price or something like that. So one to six. And then there's the uh, well, I mean, sticking with Vortex, there's the uh, the JM model, right? Mm-hmm. Which is uh, well, like a seventeen hundred dollar optic. And then if you go to like Night Force or US Optics or you know even some of the loopholds, then you're talking about you know a couple grand in uh, in that arena. So it's all over the gamut. So how do you make a how do you make a choice? So optics are one place where I'm going to kind of encourage folks to to go ahead and, and work a couple overtime shifts, save some money. Um, you know, take the couch cushions apart and, and all of those kind of things. Because optics are someplace where, one, um, we can swap them gun to gun as we improve guns or do that. Uh, but but it is, if we can't see it and we can't aim at it, we're going to have a hell of a time shooting it. And almost everybody that goes with the, the really budget optic winds up selling it off and going further, which sometimes isn't bad because sometimes those budget optics maintain their value pretty well because there's always a new guy getting in that's on a budget. Um, but I think if you can save in the $1,000 arena, you can get an incredibly good optic where you're never going to outgrow it, but it also isn't going to have any compromises in it. And, you know, you might have to pick it up used. You might have to pick it up from a guy who's selling it because he picked it up off the prize table. But the Leopold VX6 is a, is a really good 
good optic. And I think it retails for like 1300 bucks, but you know, you'll see them on the three gun, uh, you know, in the three gun forums and stuff like that for sale for 900 to a thousand, the Jerry Michelek scope, you know, you'll see those on sale for a lot of times, you know, maybe a little bit more than a thousand, but not much more. Um, you know, and you, you kind of get into a class of optics where the repeatability of the adjustments are very good. The, uh, the illumination is daylight bright. The glass is very clear. You don't have compromises in shadow and haze and things like that. The glass is, is on par with some of the best glass out there. So I really try to encourage folks to spend a little extra money on the, on the optic. If they can't, the Strike Eagle is a good choice. The Vortex Viper PST is a very good choice. Um, and the Burris uh, MTAC is a very good choice. And all three of those scopes are, are under the $500 price point. They've got clear glass. They've got a usable reticle. And they'll work They'll work very well for the beginning shooter. Yeah, the uh, the Burris the Burris are definitely nice. I've shot a couple of those before the uh, the M Tax, and I was you know impressed with the glass quality, especially given that price point. Yeah. Um, however, when when compared to something of you know another thousand dollar step up, like I was able to uh, you know look down the uh, um, downrange at one of the uh, JM models of the Vortex, uh-huh. and holy crap, like that you know the huge. Um, <laughs> What is it? The rear rear glass. I'm, I don't I don't know the terminology, but the huge rear glass field of view. There we go. The huge field of view and the amount of light that that thing lets in is just incredible. You know, from going from like a you know crappy optic to the MTAC is a huge leap, and then going from the MTAC to that that vortex is another huge leap. It's just amazing how clear it is. And 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 that's exactly like I'm saying. You know, there's a there's a lot of times with the with the pistol, for instance. Um, you can take that Glock 34 we talked about, and there's guys out running that Glock 34 just as well as somebody running a, a $4,000 custom 2011. Um, but glass makes a difference. Glass is, is very uh, – there's a much higher uh, return on your investment for the dollars you spent. Um, I, I've been shooting for the U.S. Optic Scopes for a while, and they are just hands down fantastic. Uh, there is nothing – I, I shoot the dual focal plane SR8, and nobody has come even close to that. The Mark, it's the illumination's better than the Mark VI. It's better than Swarovski. It's you know, it's a first focal plane scope, so I get to have the benefit of having a Horus reticle in it. All of these kinds of things. Um, ah, fancy. And and but it's but it's again, you pay for every one of those features, and so you know that's that's one of the like I said. One of the places that I tell a, a new a new shooter to go is it, it's worth it to save up a little extra money for the optic. The the rifle we could put a we can put a newer forearm or a sexier looking forearm later, but really all that matters about the forearm on the rifle is that it's extended so we can do good barrier work and have a have a good grip and stuff like that when we're shooting from positions. Um, the optic is imperative that we have not only good vision. But that we have a way to, to do holdovers and hold under so we can hit our target at distance. And we have to have some illumination in there uh, so it'll look like a red dot as, as we're shooting close paper and we can be fast with it. Well, excellent, excellent uh, coverage of, of all three. And that was very <laughs> thorough. This is great. It sounds like you've uh, you've thought about this quite a bit. We, we've answered this so. question a lot. And that's that's honestly, that's again, that's my standard advice to new guys. Um you know, we, we, you can tweak that all you want, depending on your budget, we can, we can change that. But I mean, that's, that's still a significant expenditure, but it's, it's, it's good stuff. It's, you know, good, durable, durable rifle, shotgun, pistol, and, and you're, you're not going to be hindered at all as a new guy. Uh, you can go to a class, you can go to a bunch of matches and you're not going to have gear troubles that you're sorting through. The only troubles you're going to have to focus on is you learning the game and you learning the skill set. Yeah, and then that's uh, also gear you can grow with and uh, advance your skill set as well. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, Craig, I'm going to have to, uh, uh, next time we're together, check out that U.S. Optics uh, SR8 that you're shooting there. You, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's one of those scopes that makes you a complete glass knob. Um, 
As a matter of fact, <laughs> U.S. Optics sponsored Surefire's match, and and they gave two of those scopes away, and they're just awesome. And, and Keith Garcia had won TAC Optics, and it had gotten late in the day, and everybody wanted to get to the prize table and get out of there. And Keith, I, I'd help Pete set up the prize table, and Keith's like, what's here? And I'm like, hey, you want the scope? You want the scope? And he took it, and, you know, I mean, it, it's a good value, but, you know, I Keith's, Keith's been shooting the Swaros for a long time. And I had assumed that he would probably wind up moving the scope, you know. And I, I texted him because I had a buddy that was looking to buy one. And I said, hey, if you're going to sell that scope, I've got a buyer for you. And he texts back. He's like, hell no. I looked through this thing. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and well, um, That's a pretty good endorsement right there. Right? And and they are. They're those type of scopes that you look at them and you if you, you immediately hand them back because it'll, it'll kind of ruin you forever. Um but there's there's still a lot of good glass out there. I I love my US optic scopes. I don't see myself changing anything at all. Um they function really well. They they actually help me make up for some of my deficiencies by what they do. Um but again, you know, they're they're a top tier they're a top tier item and sometimes that's just kinda out of the out of the range for that new guy that's trying to get into it and not sure of what he wants yet. No, for sure. Well, Craig, that I mean, that I don't know if we could cover that any better. That was great, man. Well, thank you very much. But um, I want to kind of transition a little bit here and talk about going forward. We're in, in November 2015 for people that living in or listening in the future. What uh, What's next for you this season, and uh, what are you going to be doing in the off season? So um, off season is not really off season yet. Um, we've got the Seekins 3-Gun team match uh, next week, and I've, off season consists of December. <laughs> for me oh no <laughs> and, kidding and then we'll be back to shot show in january and first matches start up in february so um off season has gotten a lot shorter these days um i am actually i'm sitting down right now deciding on um matches for next year because i'm gonna i'm not only gonna shoot three gun but i'm also gonna be incorporating some precision rifle uh, I want to shoot a little more precision rifle. Uh, Barnes has been an awesome sponsor for me, and they've got a great line of ammunition. And uh, I'm, I'm, it's 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 just simply badass for three gun. But I'm also going to be shooting that with some precision rifle. Uh, Desert Tech's one of my sponsors, and they've got a great precision gun. So I'm going to be trying to, and, and it's always been an interest of mine to shoot that. So I'm just going to try to incorporate that next year. So I'm going to probably tune down the number of matches I've shot. I think I did 16 or 17 national level events and an international event this year. Wow. And it's, it's quite a bit. Um, so I think I'm trying to, going to try to cut back to maybe like 12 events next year. MGM three gun junior camp will still be intact. Um, we're going to try to teach a few more three gun classes at TPC. So hopefully people listening will uh, want to sign up for those. We, uh, we got through our first one. Um, it, it was a little bit rough as, as the first time you do something are, but Andy Peterson and I have been meeting on a pretty regular basis and we've got some good solutions, uh, to, to, and, and good principles to what we're going to try to do there. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to teaching the next one that we're going to teach because it's going to be, it's going to be a lot, uh, a lot more focused and, and I think we're going to really give some, some good value to students. Um, going to do those things a little bit more, uh, definitely surefire. Is, is on the agenda. It's such a good match. Pete does, Pete Rensing uh, is absolutely a stage design genius, and a lot of people don't know about that match, but it is um, it's by far one of the best design matches in in of the year, and it really does. It hits every variation of three gun in one match, and it really truly is a test overall uh, of who can who who really shoots three gun the best uh, across the board base stages long iron man type stages there's a couple knife stages uh there's uspsa nationals type stages um so it's a really good match uspsa nationals is on the board mgm iron man's always on the board um gonna definitely shoot a three gun uh regional to make sure i get qualified for three gun nationals next year those were that was a really good system this year i really like what three gun nation has done with that um, and then we'll, we'll see what kind of precision rifle pops up. Um, I'd, I'd be silly to not shoot, uh, Jim Shepard's starlight night match again. And hopefully he's able to pull off what his plan is and have, have a couple of those matches around the country. That was absolutely insane to be shooting three gun and have a live band, um, 
have food and entertainment all night long while you're shooting. It was just, oh, wow. it was off the hook. And then the prize table and the, the cash prizes were fun. Um, I think, you know, it, it was the first one. So obviously that, you know, there was a lot of things they were trying out and, uh, having met Jim Shepard just a year ago and seeing the enthusiasm that guy, that guy has and, and seeing the, the experience and the knowledge that he has, uh, for him to pull that off in the first year and, and to have even bigger plans for subsequent years, that thing's going to be huge. So try to do that again as well. Well, it sounds like you've got a uh, full season coming up here and uh, if people have questions for you. They can find you on Facebook and it's Craig Outson, O U T Z E N. And uh, if they want to follow you on Instagram, which is my favorite platform, it's uh, Instagram.com slash three gun concepts. So Craig, this, this has been a, a lot of fun, man. We went like two hours. I know folks are going to totally eat this up, but uh, we covered so much good stuff and there was never a dull moment. Nope. So, hey, man, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday night and uh, for coming back on the show again. Any Anytime you want, man. I love doing this. It's always good talking with you. I, love, I enjoy it. Now that we've met, we can, uh, we'll can we even have a lot more fun. Excellent. So well, thank you, you Craig. You bet. Take care, man. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Craig Outson. I had so much fun with Craig. We had such a good time covering a ton of great topics, and time went by so quick. Two things I wanted to tell you about. One, Craig just picked up a new sponsor. It's Rudy Project. And uh, Craig wanted me to let you know that you can receive a 50% off coupon by just sending Craig a message on Facebook. The other thing is that they finalized the training that they're doing at the uh, TPC for a multi-gun boot camp. Now, this is with Brian Nelson. Andy Peterson, and Craig Outson, and it's in March of 2016. And both of those things, if you're interested, you can check out links at 3 slash episode 43. If you have any thoughts, feedback, or guest suggestions, you can email me. I'm Dave at 3 gunshowcom You can also, also catch me on Instagram at 3 gunshow and Facebook, just 3 gunshow As always... Please leave a review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it is huge for getting the show in front of shooters like you and I. Just visit 3gunshow.com slash iTunes and leave a review. If you like the show and you want to show your support, <laughs> you can do so by using our affiliate link when you shop at Brownells. Just go to 3gunshow.com slash Brownells and shop like normal. We earn a small commission on what you buy at no additional cost to you and it helps to cover the cost of hosting, email lists, Skype, and the like. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'll catch you in the next episode. If you are finished, unload show clear.